Welcome to In The Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm excited to have Jose Rosado on the call with us today, who is a photographer and also the host of the Angry Millennials podcast and also an instructor at the University of Baltimore. So we might dig into a little bit about that. But I know before we started the conversation that offline, we were talking a little bit about how we got started. And I think that's going to be a good place for us to dig in this idea of how do you build any kind of business and definitely leverage the platform of a blog and a podcast to grow your business. So Jose, thank you so much for being on In the Trenches with us today. No, of course. Thank you. I mean, it, it, I mean even the name, <laughs> you know, when I, uh, when I heard about it, I was like, that's kind of where I live. So uh, I love I'm glad to be here. Perfect. So with you, I want to start from the beginning. Give us uh, your background. How did you get to what you're, you're doing a lot of things? And that's why I asked, mm-hmm. because I'm curious a little bit about your backstory. It's going to give some context to the rest of the conversation. Sure, sure, sure. sure. I, let's see, we can go way back and I know it's a 25 minute show, so I'll keep it brief, but uh, way back was never a great student, you know, in high school and stuff like that. Went to college, ended up realizing, you know, I'm pretty cool when you're learning about things you want to know. Graduated with honors and then went on to grad school and got my MBA. So into the in the trenches kind of mindset, I, you know, I went to grad school full time. I worked at a studio full time and I worked club on the weekends because as we all know, grad students are broke and um, it was great. But then I graduated in 08. And it was a really, really tough time to find work, especially in New York, where I was living at the time. I luckily found photography my senior year of college. And, you know, what I thought would be six months, you know, while I look for work, I'll just do this and make money, ended up being six years. Apply to jobs and see if I can get, you know, quote, a real job. And uh, it never panned out for one reason or other. So I just started embracing the photography thing. And this was, you know, before really social media became what but it was enough that I had friends all over the world who were photographers, you know, and, and we'd chat on Facebook and I'd travel the country all the time and couch surf and hang out with all of them and do photo walks together and stuff like that. So it was fostering that community. And, you know, fast forward, you know, seven, eight years later, I started getting into teaching when I moved to Balt- outside Baltimore from Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And my whole life kind of a different turn. Not nothing <laughs> sounds bad to say that, but I went from being a single guy in the city to now I'm, you know, with my fiance and two kids in the suburbs. So it was a very big change for me personally. Mm-hmm. And around that time, I decided to take that time to say, hey, let, let's see what I can do on time. You know, because at that time I was kind of getting tired of the feast and famine of the freelance stuff. And I worked um, remotely for a New York company. And I could not worry about where my paycheck was coming from now that kids were in the picture. And um, that really helped. And then it was great until when I moved here uh, about a year in, I got laid off. And that was, you know, pretty tough, you know, to be uh, scared, honestly, you know, by myself. But it's a whole other ballgame when it was, you know, two little kids and my fiance and it was a change. Now that kind of that interesting time you know, again, to the in the trenches kind of mantra, it's, it's when it was a really tough time for me, you know, here I am with two degrees and great work experience for a publicly traded company. I'm thinking I could get another job a month, if that, and I didn't get a job for two and a half years. And in that time, as you can imagine, it was tough. It was very tough, but I look back on it. And as we were talking, as we were chatting about before the call, I actually And looking back, say to myself, it was necessary because before that, I was just a photographer. That's all my art was. That's all I thought I knew I could do. I realized very quickly, I better figure out (laughs) some other stuff to do. So I started teaching at the local community college and I started writing, actually. And and when I started writing, I got a job at F-Stoppers and I started seeing, wow, like here I am doing stuff for myself again and I'm seeing more progress than I did in, you know, the past six months of 
working full time on looking for a job. I just said, you know what? Let me just run with this. Talk to my family, talk to everybody and said, give me a month, you know, give me a month to not look for a work, to not go on interviews and just concentrate on doing my own thing. And they were very supportive. And that's when I started the podcast and, you know, it went from there. You know, the, the power of podcasting, as I'm sure you know, is that quickly, you know, I, like I mentioned, all my friends that I knew online, all these people I cultivated relationships with for years, but never got to meet or, or it was just online. Next thing you know, we're all meeting up at expos and conferences and having these amazing interviews about, you know, everything, um, you know, about life, about the trials and tribulations, about, you know, mental health, then started seeing the power of podcasting, you know, of the fact that now with digital media, unlike five, you know, 10 years ago, before in the past, if you wanted press credentials, you either had to be shooting for a magazine or newspaper or, you know, radio station or whatever. But nowadays that's all our place with, you can have a blog, you know, you can have a website and you can have a podcast and that, you know, like that's a new norm. And it was wild who we got to, um, you know, sit with. That's pretty interesting. And I'm, I'm curious about that because you've been basically through it all, um, mm-hmm. year to graduate. Uh, but I, I, you know, that's, I think part and parcel to kind of what you've been able to build to is being put in those kind of extenuating cir- circumstance of having to fend for yourself and, right, and right. get into that world of eat what you kill, right. Which is any kind right. of, you know, service, you know, anybody freelancing or running on their own, doing their own thing. So tell me this, I, I think this is a question that comes up a lot. I speak with creatives who are offering any sort of professional service, but uh, kind of on the creative end, things like art, et cetera. The biggest challenge always comes to how do you actually sell it? So mm-hmm. you got started, you were, you were obviously taking pictures, you know, getting good at the photography. Tell me a little bit about how you actually got your first sales. Like what was the process and, and how has that changed over time? And then we'll segue into some of the other stuff you're doing. You know, like, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm 34, I'm not, you know, 60, right? So I'm young enough that I, I totally get social media, I'm on it and I understand it, but I'm old enough that I remember how things were. And I think honestly, a lot of it hasn't changed. Now, the vehicle in which you conduct the business or maybe market the business, yes, that has changed. It's still a people to people thing. You know, people aren't really necessarily buying just my photographs. I mean, they're buying me as a person. You know, they're they're investing in me to their trust and their hard-earned money to, you know, get the video for their photo shoot or, you know, magazine shoot or whatever it may be I'm getting hired for. So it's very much still selling yourself. So originally it was just, you know, hey, who needs pictures? I, originally I started out as a glamour photographer. And, you know, I worked, like I said, I worked at a club and I knew friends who were always very attractive and it was literally easy. I was just like, Hey, you want pictures? Let's do this and tell your friends. And it grew to, Oh, okay. Like, let's see, I want to break into kind of like commercial work. Oh, who do I know at companies who need pictures? You know, and some of my friends in New York, obviously they landed jobs and they were working in different industries, started doing that. And then, like I mentioned, it wasn't until the podcasting that I, it really, really, really sank in that this was a great vehicle. Like I had mentioned, this is not years ago and I wouldn't have been able to get the access that I've got to, you know, or have been getting through the podcast. And it was amazing because now I'm going to these mostly expos for creatives. Now we talked to every, talk to magicians, actors, you know, one, one, one of that's recently people will remember is Taserface from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. We actually had him on and it was, Mm. it was really interesting. We had him on when he knew gotten the word that he landed that movie like the day before. And he was none, he, like he obviously couldn't talk about it, Mm. you know, but again, it's the people we got access to. And it was just amazing because now I could go to these expos and these trade shows and even just people and reaching out to people in general and saying, Hey, do you want to chat or do you want to sit for an hour with me and really just get granular on whatever you want, you know, what your passion is and all this kind of stuff. And it's honest and it's raw. And I told people you can curse because I want you to be comfortable. And that was a big thing. And I didn't realize it then, but it started kind of the mental health side started creeping in there because people then would start asking other interviews a while in, 
where they would say, listen, we have to ask, like, how do you get people to share things really never talked about in an interview before? And I started thinking about, like, you know, right there on the spot. And I said, well, maybe it's the way I, I set up the interview. I go, because the way it's set up is like in two parts, really. The first, you know, two thirds of the show, we're talking about you, we're getting to know you, we're having fun. We're talking about, you know, your project or your company or everything you want to talk about and getting to know you. And then the last third, so I asked everyone these same exact questions, no matter who they were. And a lot of them were, you know, we, I would joke around with them and say, are you ready to go like second level deep? Because <laughs> we're this is what's going to happen right now. And, you know, I would ask them, like, what's the biggest failure in your career? What's the biggest, great, you know, good thing? And people would share things like parents passing away and them never taking pictures of them. Or comedian Mickey Coachella who is, is saying that his mom got very ill. And at the height of his career, he was doing an HBO special. And um, and his mom was in the hospital. They didn't know if she was going to make it. And the, or the uh, producers for the show actually talked to the hospital and got her to come with a nurse. And he didn't know any of this. And he looks up and he goes, there is my mom. You know, and, and all of a sudden, with all the same thing, you know, the jib and the cranes and all that, the big pro- you know, production that HBO is, he goes, it's my mom in the kitchen. And I was just telling her jokes, you know, like growing up. Mm. She passed away not too long after that. But he said, you know what, just the fact that she could have been there was amazing, you know, and these are just some of the stories. And that's what people want to buy. That's what people get hooked on is your story. You know, yeah, you have a great product that's important at its very core. Storytelling is still the most powerful you know, way of really conducting business. I like that. I'm a big, big proponent of that too. Although maybe not the best at actually telling the stories, that's something I'm trying to improve. But I think that's so, so important. Or what industry you're in, there's probably some sort of story you can tell that's going to target the pull at the heartstrings, so to speak, of of the audience members. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's especially important for people in creative pursuits like photography to do that. It's like, how do you stand out? Well, you need the story. When it gets to straight right. business type stuff, yeah, you can always say, well, here's, you do this, you'll make this amount of money. But when it comes to things outside of that, where it's not a one-to-one correlation, I think story is fundamental to be mm-hmm. able to, to capture the interest of, of people. Let me ask you this. Tell mm-hmm. me a little bit about why you started the Angry Millennial Podcast and why the title. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. Funny, when people would hear the title, they'd always laugh. I'd give them the card, it was, and the angry was in bright red and... It was very, you know, eye catching and they'd laugh and go, the angry money, uh huh? And I go, yeah. And they're like, you know, you're just screaming the entire time and ranting. And I said, no, not so much. You know, I'm, I'm not really that angry per se in person, but it started making me think because I'll be honest, I never knew I was a millennial. Not until I realized anyone from 1980 to whatever it is, 92, whatever, um, is a millennial. And it was kind of wild. You know, and I said, oh, okay, because I consider myself more of a gen like that for a long time. I started thinking, okay, well, yeah, I guess we do have a lot in common. And I was talking to someone, we were having one of those late night, deep, you know, conversations about life. And she said, um, we're actually the first generation of failed institutions. And I said, well, okay, explain. And she said, well, you know, we're the first generation of, um, of divorce, you know, the first adult children of divorce. We're the first generation that, you know what, college isn't all that it's cracked up to be for the price and the the amount of debt, you know, that we have in this country. And in reality, just realizing now the job market, because of the, you know, 08 collapse, now there's no trust and security in any job, you know, out of that economy. You know, when I had that job, I was a 1099 freelancer. You know, it just so happened I was lucky enough. They w- liked me enough and wanted me enough that they, I worked 40, 50 hours. You know, the 1099 part was more of a technicality at that point. But in the end, when I got laid off, it mattered. That was, you know, part of the decision, which is, again, that time made me really angry. And that kind of played into it, you know, was the whole thing where, hey, look, I didn't want this, but I did everything I was, quote, supposed to do. You know, I went to school. I got another degree, <laughs> you know, like I did all these things that, you know, I know life always kicks in the teeth, but at the same time, I changed for the better, did what I had to do, was proud of it, you know, was proud to graduate with honors, was proud to, you know, accomplish the things I did, but here I am, 
12 years into my career, I honestly question it sometimes. You know, if I didn't just go straight into working or if I didn't, you know, do a whole bunch of other things. Um, so it, it, out of that came, you know, the, the festering anger. So those kind of things. And we talk about, hey, like, you know, what does it feel like to be a digital photographer when everyone's a photographer now? You know, there's more competition, there's more noise, and there's tons of entrepreneurs out there. So whether you sell a product or a service, you have to distinguish yourself somehow. And the only thing that's different for every single person is your story. Well, like I said, people don't want to buy things. Yes, their lives easier. But at the end of the day, I have a million choices. What's going to tell me to go for X over Z? Most of the time, for me at least, it's because I heard something about X's story and what they believe in and their mission. They can have my hard-earned money, you know, as opposed to someone who just mm-hmm. I just see an ad for. That's interesting. And for you, when you started, was there, I guess, was there a plan behind it or was it really for you? Was it just to, to see what would happen? Yeah, honestly, it was that. It was just, let's see what happens. Because I had the idea for about a year and I never told anyone. I never said anything about it. I had a buddy, one of my first people I had on, Corin Prescott, a good friend of mine, a photographer, just moved to Seattle. And he said to me, he goes, you know what? You should start a podcast. And I said, eh, I don't know. There's so many people that are already doing it, like so-and-so and so-and-so. And they go, so what? They're not you. And I was like, okay, you know? <laughs> and he's like, doesn't matter. When he talks, a lot of times, he, he really brings a thunder <laughs> you know, because it's been a while coming. And, you know, he, he honestly was the biggest push for me to start it. And the few times we had touch points throughout the time when when the show got you know, bigger. And when I was traveling more, it was all from a great place. And, and and it was all kind of grounding me because he said it, you know, he all right things that I needed to hear when I needed to hear. Them. And so what started out as, Hey, let's do this. Then became, uh, I brought on a, a co-host for a while, a photographer as well. So then I said, all right, we have three weeks to get this started, get a website and do everything, learn the audio and all of it in three weeks because Photo Plus in New York is going on. And that's like the last big expo of the year. So everyone, the who's who of photography, and it's it's a great, you know, pool of talent to um, you know, if you wanted to go as a press guy and interview some people. And from there kind of it kind of took off. You know, we had Chase Jarvis when he when I saw him there, who I knew to be on the show. He's the creator of um co-founder of uh, was it creating the depression creative live. he's yeah creative live yep. there you go thank you which is a huge free online learning platform you know and and is really killing it in just creative space but all of life you know it's all about you know quality of life honestly and from there it just kind of kind of took off you know so i started just putting a hundred percent into it and always constantly checking my my partner you know, Jessica and my parents and saying, Hey, listen, like, can we give me one more month? You know, what do you think? Are you still okay with this? You know, because I knew it was, it was risky. I knew it was, uh, I don't want to say foolish, but you know, that's most of the stuff is right. I mean, I was putting, pouring myself into an online radio show that at that time was making no money and, you know, had maybe like one small advertiser. And, but at the same time I knew, I said, look, if I want this thing to be any, I'm going to have to give it a hundred percent. If I treat it like a hobby, I'll only get a hobby return. And, you know, I started just going all in, you know, traveling, begging, borrowing miles from friends and family. Like I did anything I could to keep costs down, but I traveled as much as I could to do the show. And people, you know, it showed. I mean, within a few months, we had amazing guests on, you know, we had more than a few paid advertisers. I mean, and people would ask me like, dude, this thing kind of blew up. You know, we were on the, we rose to number, number two in our category and new and noteworthy. And we stayed there for, you know, seven weeks. It went from one day a week show to a two day a week show to at towards the end, well, not the end, because it's, um, I would say not hiatus right now, we we'll conscious of other things, but um, we went 101 episodes and towards the end, it was three days a week. So every day, if you ask me what I was doing, it was literally either writing uh, recording an episode, getting prep for another interview or traveling uh, along with teaching and having kids. So it, when it got that big, I said, you know what, I'm going to have to take a break and, you know, maybe treat this like seasons 
instead of just going on into perpetuity like some people do. And so that way I could have like a little mental break. Yeah. So we, we took, honestly, it was about, you know, now that I mentioned it, it was probably about a year ago now that we said, you know what, we're going to press pause. We're coming back. And I, I knew at that time, this other initiative that I started called Creators Against Depression was slowly starting to kind of snowball uh, on the back burner. And I wanted to take time to really kind of dive into that and see what's possible. That's very cool. So now as you do a lot of things, you're still doing a lot of things. How do you actually manage all these things? How do you prioritize? Well, I think um, just like anybody else, it's, you know, prioritizing what's important to you. And as a creative, I struggle with for uh, uh, years, you know, and I think now I'm starting to get, and I, I still do at times, but I'm starting to get better at it, is your priorities change. And it's not just from being single to having a family, like, of course, but your art change. You know, like I'm still a photographer, but I don't do it full time anymore. You know, I like teaching it instead. You know, I still shoot when I can, of course, you know, but that was a hard transition to make. No longer make that a huge priority, you know. And then, for instance, with the Angry Millennial show, I mean, I loved, loved podcasting. And right now, I think the podcast movement is going on, the uh, annual kind of uh, expo for podcasting. I wanted to go, but, you know, but again, it's not a priority right now. So when I, when I uh, decided to take more of creators against depression on and see what I could do in the mental health space, you know, again, I'm a very much all in type person. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go all in for creators against depression. I'll still do some podcasting when I can. I'll still do some hosting and some interviewing when I can. Um, but this is now my, my next priority. Just like anyone will tell you, just like any living thing, I had to feed it every once in a while. You know, so I still shot every once in a while. So it took, a, you know, a couple of weddings a year, you know, to shoot or, or still took on some magazine shoots a couple of times a year. You know, I then co-host other shows or I would interview when I could remotely for podcasting. You know, I needed something that, again, to water that plant. But at the same time, a new priority, like we talked about earlier, is I actually threw creators against depression and that became, it was a website that became a medium publication and a blog that we started doing talks at colleges, um, like TED style talks, and then a weekly support group called Together We Got This with people I actually met through podcasting, you know, Mickey Coachella and other people. And now that just celebrated a year. Every Tuesday we have a support group. I mean, every, every week for a year now. And out of that and out of serving on boards and working my way into people's offices, doing certification courses, I now recently got a job at a, at a uh, community action agency as a case manager. And now, mind you, again, going back to the, in the trenches, I was slammed in my face a lot in that year. You know, people go, hey, it's great what you're doing. We love what you're doing. But you don't have a social work degree or a human services degree or a psychology degree. You know, I, did, I studied advertising undergrad, you know, but I had to, again, prioritize and say, I want this. And it still is a big part of who I am is promoting mental health. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to keep going. Lo and behold, almost three years later, I finally got another job, if you will. And it's in a completely different field. You know, I've changed careers and I still have my art as well. I love it. And that's fantastic to hear. I mean, I think that's the thing that um, always challenges me is this idea of like, where do I put the time and effort? Because I, I always come up against and say, and I do a lot of things, so I'm kind mm -hmm. of, in that, you know, maybe that's where I feel more natural, but I also then consider, well, what if I'm just, were to just focus on this one thing, right. does that ever come up to you? And do you ever think about that? And what's your verdict? Oh, of course. I mean, of course, I, mean, I, I still do. I still struggle with it. You know, I, like I said, that we hit pause on the show and it's been a year that killed me inside, you know, because immediately after we, we paused in the show, we were, we were starting through talking to people towards the end, you know, big entrepreneurs, people who worked for, you know, Under Armour and did all these different creative things and owned their own studios. And we were starting to say, Hey, like, what if we switch to a seasonal format? And, you know, we then say, we're going to get seasonal sponsors instead of episodes. So we'd, we would change the dynamic. We would change the, the model, the business model of the show. And, you know, I had all intensive purposes of bringing the show back in like the winter. And then the winter became the, the spring. And then the spring became now, <laughs> you know, and 
it was hard. You know, a lot of people always ask me, you know, like you mentioned, I'm sure you get it all the time. Why are you always doing a million things? And I always said, I'm just a high functioning person because I, when I really, really think about it and I'm honest with myself, the times I struggled the worst with my depression and anxiety since I was 14 was when I had only one thing to concentrate on. And, and you know what? I'll be honest with you. There's been times where I'm jealous. I'm not talking down about people who punch a clock. I'm actually jealous of people who can go into work and leave at five and go home and just self-care, zone out, do whatever. And that's it. That's their whole life. And to me, it's like I could never shut off that part of my brain. You know, to me, it was always, okay, I'm doing it. now what do I do? That was naturally why taking on, you know, a couple different forms of art and, and starting a couple different companies that, you know, some failed, some succeeded was something I had to do. Like a lot in life, it's about balance, right? So I would tell people all the time when I stop shooting full time, they go, oh, why are you not shooting full time? You know, I'm such a good photographer. And I'm like, it became a job and I got burnt out and I don't want to get burnt out. Doing it full time made it not fun anymore. And for a lot of people, they just, they just are, you know what? They're, they're, I'm going to die with a camera in my hand. I'm going to die knowing I'm a photographer for life. And it's how I fed my family and kids and all that stuff. And I think that's great. But for me, I knew enough about myself to say, you know what? I want just a different job that isn't creative, but is enough of an engaging position that I can feel passion about it. But I want my art to just be my art. So I have that balance. You know, I can, I can shoot when I want. I can get a little bit more into it when I want. So to me, it's always fluid. Sometimes I'll shut down some things that I'm doing to concentrate more on self-care and concentrate on maybe one or two things or just one, like I did with the Anger Millennial, or I'll just kind of float back to just, you know, watering every single one a little bit here and there, but putting more into one that's at the top of the priority list. I love it. Well, Jose, we are actually over, all already over time. So what I want to do is give you the floor here. Where can people reach out to find you if they're interested in connecting with you or learning more about what you're doing? Or what are the best places for people who are just listening to this, you know, this podcast and interested in what you're talking about? First off, apologies. I know I'm very verbose. <laughs> so Tom, if you had like a whole bunch of questions and all that, I'm sorry. My apologies. So yeah, so you can go, my, my website is joserosado.com. So J-S-J-O-J-O-S-E-R-O-S-A-D-O photo, P-H-O-T-O.com. And from there, you'll be able to find, um, the Angry Millennial or under podcast, you'll be able to find the Craves and Suppression link, all that stuff. I love it, Jose. Thank you so much. We'll make sure that it is listed in the show notes for anybody who's listening to this, interested in finding out, definitely check that out. And if you want to check out the podcast and where those links are, you can just go to tomworks.com slash podcast. Other than that, Jose, thank you so much. This was a pleasure having you. Tom, thank you. Thank you for listening to In the Trenches. Your creative work doesn't stop here. Join the resistance, the small but growing army of entrepreneurs and artists putting a dent in the world at www.tommorkis.com. Never fight alone. Join the resistance. <laughs>